Okay, great. So I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, my voice isn't always super loud, so uh, I probably won't be talking quite this loud most of the time. But any, any uh, so I hope that everyone's sitting next to someone they're willing to talk to, because at some point, at various points, I'm going to ask you to talk to a neighbor. Um, the reason being because I come from a very particular background of math. I don't know uh, what a thread is. I don't know uh, what the, the, you know, I don't know what various monads look like in Haskell or other things. So there are going to be times where I'm going to say something and I'm not sure if it's getting across or I'm not sure if I understand the question or other things. So I'm going to ask you just to talk to someone where you can have like these kind of micro teaching moments or micro question asking moments where you kind of have in real time the ability to ask more questions particular to your own background, etc. So, um, uh, and, and during this course, what I want is for you guys to get as much out of it as you possibly can. So I have some things planned, but it's also uh, directable. So if by the third, third two hour block, I realize like this thing isn't going to be important, this thing is what everyone seems to want to know, then that's useful to know and that, that can happen. Um, I have probably too much planned, so I don't know how much of what I thought I would do, I'll actually do, or how rushed it'll seem. If it starts seeming rushed, let me know. And one way you can let me know if you don't feel like raising your hand, you certainly raise your hand if you have questions, um, especially if those questions you think are something that um, would help others beyond yourself, and usually they do, but some people's questions are really a comment that they show that they actually understand this thing way better than anybody else. That's not the kind of question I prefer <laughs> until after. Um, but if you have a regular question, please ask it. Or if you don't understand something, you can just kind of like make a face where you, the face feels natural, but it's also like a signal to me. And if like 12 people are making a face, then like maybe it's time for me to slow down or ask a question like what's going on or you, have you guys turn to a neighbor. So um, again, I just want this to work for everyone. I'm going to tell you what category theory, the basics of it are. I'm going to try to connect it to, to programming languages and, and, uh, and things. But, um, but I'm going to really focus on the math so that you can see that side of it. And that's the, that's the introduction. So uh, any questions before we start? Oh, right. And I'm going to keep a timer um, for myself. I think, so this is a two hour block, but I'm going to give you a break after 70 minutes, uh, five minute break, and then do go another 45 minutes or something. Yeah. What sort of uh, prior knowledge of any do you expect us to right. bring to this? So I hope that you know um, what a set is and what a function is. But I'm going to go over that again very, very briefly. Uh, how to compose functions. Um, maybe, I, maybe I assume you know, I assume you like are familiar with things like the word monad and how it looks in terms of bind and return and that kind of thing. But that's only like my main source. Or what I'm thinking of is that you have this, you have this cat. Okay, from my point of view, here's what you guys are doing. You have a category and you live in that category. That category may be called Hask or something else or type. That's, that's, and when you think of a functor, you think of a functor from that category to itself. So this is what I think of you guys as doing. And when you think about a monad, you're thinking about a monad on that category and all sorts of stuff like that. I'm going to tell you what categories are more broadly and give you a whole bunch of different ones. And I'm going to ask you to keep Hask as an example that you check everything I'm saying against, but not live in Hask or whatever your type theory programming language is. But try to see just the mathematical idea, kind of like living in R3. This is, this is my vector space. Whenever someone says vector space, they mean this thing. I want you to like let go of that, use R3 to think about things, think about planes, but also think about the more general idea of a category. So uh, the background necessary is, is really none, I would say. I would um, accept English proficiency and... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll start. Um, so again, there's lots and lots of different categories. And category theory was bas basically the idea that there's different branches of mathematics who need to talk to each other and to organize that way of talking to each other. So anyone from group theory would wonder why they had to learn category theory because they already know what a group is. Why would they need to learn these other categories? And anyone from programming languages or anyone from uh, quantum physics might think, well, I'm living in quantum physics. Why would I have to learn category theory to do quantum physics better? Why would I have to learn category theory to do functional programming better? Um, what, what category theory has done is build bridges across these various 
these various domains and allowed more an analogy or analogical thinking um, to occur to let you change your perspective at any given time while remaining in a perspective and not <laughs> floating between perspectives. So you can imagine like different cities, each one optimized to do a certain thing and building bridges between them rather than building one big, um, one big sprawl. So, so if you live in functional programming land, which is great and has brought a lot of people to category theory, there's still a reason to look out from, beyond, from within that to beyond and see how actually lots of things you do like directed acyclic graphs or databases or all sorts of different things within functional programming. Also vector spaces and things for say graphics are all categories and the, the value of this thing, category theory, is to help you connect them in a way that's kind of I don't know, strongly typed, or I don't know how to say it. I try to say things in your language, so just forgive me to, for, for failing constantly. Um, so what I want to start with is the category of sets. So it's denoted set, but there's all sorts of other categories too, like vect, the category of vector spaces, or hask, which is a fake, it's not quite a category, but it's, um, it's close enough, or post sets, or uh, topological spaces. There's all sorts of different categories that mathematicians study, and they study, maybe they study only certain vector spaces, like Hilbert spaces, or they maybe study only a subset of Hask, like some domain-specific language or something that is, for, for some reason, a category. But w the one that's kind of the basic that math was founded on for a while is more like the category of sets. And it's a lot like um, uh, data types and programs, which is what I think of as Hask. You have a bunch of data types, you have a bunch of programs, you can compose programs, stuff like that. The category of sets, what you're looking at, and the way I want to think about a set, is just a bag full of dots. So here's a bag full of dots, A, B, C, D, E. And you can tell, uh, if I point to two different dots, you can tell if I'm pointing to the same one or different ones. And, um, and that's about it. That's what a set is. And a function, Oh, so there's an empty set. There's a set with one element. Uh, there's the natural numbers. This bag has, of course, infinitely many elements in it. And a function is a way, a function from one set to another set is a way of assigning to each object or each element in the first set an element in the second set. And I kind of use, I kind of use, um, That arrow, which is in, ha in, in um, this, was, this means f of a equals 1. And I use a regular arrow with no uh, uh, left-hand thing to, to denote a function. OK, so there's sets and functions. And this is, as I said, there's no background. And you can tell there's no background for this talk because I'm not even assuming you know what this is. So the thing you can do with functions is you can compose them. And when I talk about categories, I'm going to be taking, this is going to be an object in the category. This is going to be an object in the category of set. This is going to be an object in the category set. So this, an object in this category is one whole set, one whole bag full of stuff. And you can, comp given functions, you can compose them. Meaning that given a function from A to B and a function from B to C, you can compose them to get a function from A to C. The last thing you need for a category, besides objects and what it means to have a function or a morphism, is you need a, a notion of identity, which means that, the, that given a set A or X um, or C, there's a function from C to C that does nothing, the identity function. And that's very boring in some sense. Why would you need that? It's kind of like saying, why would you need zero in numbers? Um, zero, zero, zero is no cows. I don't have any cows. Why would I count the number of cows if I had no cows? It just helps you think what, about what minus means or helps you think about what isomorphism means. So an isomorphism between two sets, you have the number of people. There you have the set of people. This is a bag where the set is all the people in this room. And you have the set of chairs. And uh, I guess not, actually. This is, there's <laughs> not a function. There, there may be a function this way. Every chair has a person, but there's no function this way. But let's say there was. Let's say everyone has a place. 
a place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so every person has a place. These are bijective, meaning that there's a function that takes every place, every standable place for some reason. See, that again, it's false. But so every place has a person, and every person has a place. And when you do f followed by g, oh, I'm going to write it that way, f followed by g. This is also denoted g circle f sometimes. This is more common. f followed by g is the identity on place. I mean, if you take a place and you look at the person standing there, and then you look at the place that they're in, they're in that place. And that's what... Uh, what isomorphism means, and that's kind of what cardinal numbers mean if you want. It's just a way of, of talking about sets based on what's isomorphic to them. I don't care about the labels um, in my set. I care about how many things there are in it. And so isomorphism says that F circle G and G circle F are both identity on their respective um, domains and codomains. So identity helps you say what isomorphism is. You can get from one to the other and come back and be where you started. OK, so, so that's that. So there are some very special sets. So far, I've told you what a category is. I just haven't told you that I told you what a category No, I did that too. <laughs> uh, but all the stuff I've told you is what a category, are the structures of a category. And I'm going to take that in the next, uh, after the first 70 minutes thing, and I'll give you a break. I'll start telling you what a category is in general. And all the things I'm saying will have correlates there. But I just want to do it in a concrete world first. So, so far I've told you about sets, functions, composition, identity, isomorphism. There's also something called the initial set. And that is a set with no elements in it. It's also called the empty set. But it's called the empty set, the initial set, because for any other set, for any A, there is a unique function from empty set to A. And we often write when there's a unique function, oh, this is a big problem, actually. So in, um, when I write an arrow, I mean one element of arrow type. If you're used to seeing arrow type, like A arrow B as a, as a, as a type, when I write an arrow, I'm generally meaning one, one element. So I've chosen my A arrow B. And I write an F under it to mean this is the name of the one I've chosen. But this is just a, a diagrammatic or um, notational difference between how category theorists write and how functional programmers write. If I write an arrow, I'm thinking of one element of type arrow. I'm thinking of one term, not the whole set. So that's just background. There is exactly one arrow or morphism or function from the empty set to A for any A. And the reason is to give a morphism from, from A to B or something, I have to, for every element of A, give one element of B. But that, that, never, that for all, for every element, never gets started here. There's exactly one way to, for every element here, get an element of A. And that is, uh, I'm done before I start. And because for any A, there's exactly one way to get to it from the empty type or empty set, we call it initial. It's kind of on the left of the whole world. And similarly, there is the terminal set. What's the one way that you get from nothing to something? The one, so to give a function, I have to specify for every element of this, one element of this. So for every element of this, I'm going to do something. OK, I did it. So as long as, I, as long as I fulfill the definition, I have a function. I don't know who asked, so I'm kind of looking in this general direction. <laughs> um, so does that make sense? There's one. So this might be more Is it easy. Kind of like a vacuously true statement? It's a vacuously true statement. So it says for all, for all um, let's call this x. So a function f taking x to a is for all x in x, there exists a unique uh, a in a such that f of x equals a. I don't know who can read this kind of script, but uh, um, right. So this, this is vacuously satisfied because the for all never gets started on the x in x. Would it also just having like, uh, a set with one element also satisfy that? So let's see how many functions there are from a set with one element to a. So for everything here, I need to give one element here. So there's three. 
there's three functions from, from the one element set to A, to this A. But you're actually pretty, I mean, your intuition may be right, which is that the terminal set has one element. And there's exactly one function from anything to the terminal set. So this could be called unit. There's exactly one function from A to unit type. You just return the exact one element of the unit type. So these guys can be defined in any category. They might not exist. A certain category might not have an initial or a terminal object, but they do. You can talk about what it would mean to have one. And um, one thing that we've noticed, oh, I forgot to say something, but so let's, let's denote, let me denote something. Let's denote the set of maps functions from A to B by, from A to B, by, so you might say, um, so I'm going to cross this out. That's kind of one way to think about it. But instead I want to write it, because we're working in a category theory class, let's write it how category theorists would, or category theorists could write it like this. Sets version of maps from A to B. Or homomorphisms, which is just an old-fashioned term, from A to B. Set thinks, the category set thinks that a homomorphism from A to B is a function. Um, so what we've just said is that hom from the, from the empty set to A has one element. So um, is isomorphic to the set 1. So what is a function from, from this thing to this thing? It's like a program that takes in nothing and gives you an A. Like, there's exactly one of these. That means that it's in bijection with or isomorphic to the set 1. 1 goes to the unique function, the unique function goes to 1. So, it's hard. so how do you say this thing has cardinality 1, meaning it has one element? You could write it this way. It doesn't matter what we call the element of the set. I'm just saying there's one thing in there. Um, we also know that hom from A to the one-point set is also isomorphic to the one-point set. So is it this? How does it? How is this? Okay. Let me see. I have one question about the yeah. C to C there. The identity. Yeah. Is that not, is it or is it not the same as just showing C with a bunch of identity arrows inside? Just showing C with a bunch of identity arrows inside? Because yeah. it's all, it's objects to object arrows, or are these mappings? To so them? these guys, these bags full of dots, don't have any structure, so they don't have any identity arrows inside. They don't have any arrows inside at all. There's nothing inside but dots. Okay. Um, later, we'll get to see a way in which everything you just said makes perfect sense. Um, but right now, that, that doesn't, what you just said makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean by that is I can interpret what you said in a different category, and, have, and that category is equivalent to the category of sets. So in my mind, that's what I'm thinking, right? Uh, um, and what you said makes sense. But right, there's no arrows inside. They're just dots. There's just a bag full of dots. And, um, and the arrow f function from C to C is not anything about what's going on inside of C, because nothing can go on. It's just a number of things in there. It's about a, a way of taking, um, it's like if you have the natural numbers, and you, oops, you have the real numbers, and you multiply by 2, you get a new real number. And then you divide by 2, you get a real number. And now you have a function from reals to reals, and it's the identity function. Yeah. Oh, yes. What does it mean? Oh, it means, so curly brace ABC means ABC. So curly brace star means. Um, Right? This is the old-fashioned way of, well, it's nicer than this because this, 
I don't know. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yes, this means a bag with one thing in it, and that one thing is labeled one. And that one thing is labeled the And all these guys are the same set up to isomorphic. They're all isomorphic sets. This one is this set. This one is uh, that set. <laughs> and this one is that set. So there's a little dot labeled one, a little dot labeled smiley, a little dot labeled star. And um, there's functions between them. There's a unique function from this to this, and I know that because there's a unique function from anything to a one element set. So there's a unique, unique function that takes that guy there. There's a unique function that takes this guy there. And if you go around trip, you get back where you started. I don't know. I'm going to assume that we're going to this later. No. <laughs> <laughs> so all this is. Um, so try, so, so, okay, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? What is use? I'm trying to connect this information with what we've just learned. So either you're just saying this is a corollary of the initial set from the set You mean the usefulness of these three things? Oh, it's, be, it's, very, it's very important to me that these are isomorphic because I don't want you to care what I put, what I call this thing. I don't want you to look at this and this as different things, except okay. that they're labeled differently, but they're like kind of the same bag of dots. Like, here's a bag of dots and it's got, like, I call it smiley and you call it one, but there's an isomorphism, so we have a perfect translation system. Uh, in which case, then you can just say, like, oh, any set of cardinality one. Exactly. I really just want any set of cardinality one. I just didn't know what to call it, so I kept changing my name for it and not liking it and but then I said no you don't have to care about that I don't care about that so, okay so yeah you can turn all the arrows backwards on this empty unit so why is this more interesting than the other way around so there's no function so what is hom from uh, unit to to empty set well for every element of this guy I need to give an element to that guy but there are no elements of this guy so I fail there's no, there's no arrows from this guy to this guy. Did I change your question, or do you still have your question? Well, this idea of empty is something, I guess. Yeah, I see. Okay, so it's not the case that every er function is reversible. Um, relations are reversible. Those are things where you have a bag of dots, another bag of dots, and you're allowed to kind of um, send something to more than one place or no places. And then you can reverse things, but with functions you can't. Okay. Yeah. There's a function from nothing to something, but there's no function from something to nothing. Okay. Yep. Is that just because the domain is important and the codomain isn't? Or no. Like the I mean, it's almost metaphysical. It <laughs> okay, yeah. It Category theory can get kind of spiritual, but it's really a personal, <laughs> that's a personal thing. <laughs> the quantifiers there, the for all, it's fine if there, are, if there is nothing that satisfies the for all, but there has to be something that satisfies that there exists. Yep. So the upside down A doesn't need, it's fine if there's nothing, but the backward D, you have to have something. If you found one X, you better find an A for it. No. He said, well, only if because of the order. If you have... He said the X central has to exist, and I said, yeah, assuming you found the X to begin with. So right, so, there, so the question, that question could be asked, is there a function from the empty set to itself? And there is. And there is, because even though there's nothing in this guy, there is one for every time you this thing fired. So your trigger fires whenever you find something in X, and then you need to be able to locate or produce an element in A. It, it also makes a little more sense if you think about the, the contrapositive of the state of like a vacuously true statements. Like every unicorn is also a, um, every unicorn is purple. Doesn't really make sense because there are no unicorns. But if you flip it on its head and say everything that's not purple is not a unicorn, that's a true statement. So every unicorn is purple is also a true statement. Okay. <laughs> if that's helpful. I don't know. It that, might that, be. That helps me to think about okay. these things. Yeah. They don't make sense. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <laughs> empty to empty is runtime exception? Yeah, okay. I'm allowed to have it, but once I try... I'll give you... Uh, when we get to monads, I might talk about exceptions. So, um, do people want a chance now to talk to your neighbor, or do you want, I had one more thing before I had a planned moment of that, but if people have a lot of questions, or does anyone want to kind of put a figure up if they want to talk now to their, and it looks like no. Okay. So, the, la the next thing I wanted to talk about um, 
is called universal properties. So universal properties were kind of one of the first uh, big ideas of category theory. And it's going to be difficult to motivate this. So you just have to kind of look at it and try to get it for no reason. <laughs> so suppose you have sets, given sets A and B. Um, what is, what's special about their product? I'm not sure why I'm writing this product. About their product. So by their product, I mean the set of pairs. So the product is A times B is a set of pairs A, B, where A is in A and B is in B. Do you guys like this epsilon symbol or the colon symbol? Yes. Epsilon? Okay, great. Um, that is the set of pairs A, B. Is it small for people, what I'm writing? Okay. Yes. Okay, it's a little small for some people. Okay, so, uh, but what's special about, like, who, who made up this definition? What does it do? So one way to think about it, when you're, like, when I first thought products were cool as a kid was, like, I needed to count the number of things in a grid, right? And it's the number of things in the grid is the... Uh, product, so the number of things in the grid of 5 by 3 is the product of 5 times 3. Um, what's special about that, that situation, in some sense, is that if you have any set x, and you're able to get a, a vertical coordinate, a row, is this low? This is probably low. So if you have any set x, and you have a way of getting a vertical coordinate and a horizontal coordinate from everything in x, then you're able to get an actual location for everything in X in the grid. So you have a grid, you say, what row, what column is my point in? That completely defines a grid point. And that's what makes, that's the relationship between A times B and A and B. So that's expressible in a universal property. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of category, a lot of, mm, a lot of programming is operational, say where you say how you're going to implement something. But category theory tends to be more denotational, meaning like what does it do and how does it behave with other sets and other objects. And so instead of saying how am I going to implement pairs, or A times B, as pairs, I want to say what A times B does in terms of other objects. So what, is, what does um, A times B do? So it says for any, so first of all, a times B projects to A and to B by first and second. So that's what it does, but it does that the best of anybody else. So for all um, imposters, or all second best, A to B, so if you have any set X and you have some uh, <coughs> hope, you have some way of getting an A and a B. You get from every X a, a, a row and a column. There exists a unique X to A times B. So there's A times B sitting there as like the king of all things, or queen, or any other thing, mapping to all X, all A times Bs, all A's and B's, and any other, uh, any other X maps to A times B, there's a function where this diagram commutes. And I haven't said what that means yet. That means I have first and second. I have my fake one, or maybe it's the real deal. Maybe this is A times B also, and they're both competing to be the, the, the royal king, king times, whatever. So, uh, so there exists a unique map. Let's call it, um, I could call it anything, Q. So there's Q. And I know that if I do Q followed by first, that's F. And if I do Q followed by second, that's uh, S. So if I, for any X, for any X mapping to the grid, sorry, for any X it maps to both a row and a column, there's a map from X to the grid, where if you project down to the row or column, you get back where you started. That's what it says. So A times B is like the best one at mapping to A and B. And is, uh, are you allowed to lose information? 
there's no loss of information because for any x, um, if you have f and s, you can recover them by getting a map to the, to the grid. You can recover f and s by mapping to the grid and then projecting down. So you're replacing two functions, one to a and one to b, by one function from x to a times b. Uh, unless, unless X and A and B have to be sort of the same, right? I mean, I so why don't we have everyone, so let's talk to your neighbor and ask that sort of question and try to answer the other person's question. And then if there are any questions that the group has, then after we're done with that little two or three or four minute time, that group can ask me a question and, okay, so talk to your neighbor and figure out what's going on with this universal property stuff. <laughs> Hi. And I'll walk around, so. Basically, I read uh, a lot of your book. You do what? I read a lot of your book. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. I hope you're going to, I hope. Uh, are you, I, you seem to be doing it, but are you going to continue with the kind of motivating, like, why is this? Why is this important? Why, how, how I hope so. I hope so. How do you map uh, adjuncts to real life? And right, right. I hope so. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I will. I'll try, yeah. yeah. I'll try. Are you also going to talk about your representation, you know, how you can represent knowledge? No. Uh, God, no. That is some cool stuff. Yeah, okay, I, cool. I wish there was a lot more of that, like, I've looked at, like, other of your papers and stuff, and, like, there was a really good summary of this, like, the, what, 20-page summary of kind of, like, the whole book. Okay. Have you talk more about, you know, how can you represent knowledge and networks? Yeah. Have you talked yeah. about that in other places? I don't know. Uh, maybe online. I mean, on videos. Oh, really? Yeah, there's some videos of me talking about stuff. I'm not okay. sure. Have you been focusing a lot on that or not so much? Not as much recently. Uh, what have you been focusing on recently? Uh, dynamical systems. But let me, let me try to see what's going on with some yeah, other yeah, people. Yeah, 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 I'll yeah. talk to you afterwards. That'd be fun. Yeah, Thanks. great. Yeah, sure. Did you get what you were asking? Yeah, I think there's an assumption of high school. It's like, it's like writing, uh, it's like a lawsuit. It's like a, you have a three two and a two two. You know, you can make them give you the same answer by ignoring something. Or losing, right? Okay, but that ignoring is a function too. Let's call that ignoring. If I have like a three tuple and I forget the last one, that'll be a function that takes three tuples to two tuples. I think you have to account for that, yeah. So there is an assumption that there's no logic. Everything is preserved. Well, I can throw it all away, but I have to do that intentionally. By projecting it out or what? Yeah, yeah. But there's just base assumption that you're not I can't detect where this assumption is happening. Right. Right. It's just a built-in assumption. I guess so. I guess so. It doesn't feel like it. I'm guessing there's something that we're not communicating on. But um, you're allowing in a for all x there is just for there to be no x. It's kind of like you're saying that all x includes nothing. This is just one category so far, though. So all, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you guys in progress? Yeah. Okay. Keep going. So two more minutes. Okay, okay. Oh, no, it's the lowest one to the A and B. Yeah. Yeah, it's the lowest one to the A and B. So, I think I learned it before. What do you say? I think I learned this before, but I, I, was, yeah. I thought it was the high, like, the thing that can project it. Oh, no, yeah. It's the closest mediator to A and B. It's sitting, like, right on A and B. Yeah. Hi. I think I got confused in my notes as you were saying the second part of this. I'm wondering if you could just like briefly cover the, the like significance of, of this portion here. Okay. Um, I guess like what's Q here? This is the unique function. Yeah, for any X and pair of maps. 
that looks and just like this. And f and s are functions? Yep. Okay, so for any x there is a function. No, for any, if, if so someone picks an x, yeah. they have some other type, they give you a function, they give you a function, uh -huh. then you can pair them. So q is the pair. I should have written that. So um, I'll, I'll tell everyone. Yeah, thanks. Is that what? Is that a composition? Yeah. 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 Is there, I don't think that there are, but there, are there any rules about whether Q needs to end up being um, uh, surjective or injective? No. All right, let's stop. So I'll try to continue. So what I realized in hearing some questions is I hadn't quite said what Q looks like. So what does Q look like? Q is this pair. Someone has picked an X, a type X or a set X, and a pair of functions, F and S. And Q, this Q I gave, is going to be F comma S, that pair. That's all it is. That's, how you, that's the constructor, I don't know, that's the thing that makes uh, uh, the function from X to the pair type. And there's a unique one of those. That's the only possible choice you could make, such that if you want to get f and s back, it's going to be the projection, the first and second. That's the only function you could make, or um, program you could make, that can take an x and get an a times b, that's going to give you this property. That's what this exists unique means. There's exactly one. And what this is saying is that pairing, um, pairing is a, this is like, this is the implementation in set is this pair thing. But in fact, this idea of products exists in lots of categories, like the category of vector spaces, the category of topological spaces, the category, all sorts of different places in the world that mathematicians study, and that one day, uh, maybe you'll study or think about. You, one day, you'll think about a category different than, than this one. Maybe you already do. And then you're going to care that products mean something there, because they always have this weird universal property and way of seeing it means something about implementing maps to pairs as single maps. It's like a way of, of condensing information. And that's, that can be useful. So um, any, I want to ask for questions, but I also don't. Are there any? <laughs> so are there any non-commenting questions about this? Yeah. Would you mind just doing like a little example? Yeah, oh, yeah. Small, I guess small, small yeah, so suppose, um, Suppose uh, uh, a small example with. Like A equals like the set of 1, 2 or something. Like that. Yeah, so let's say A is 1, 2. Yeah. And B is red, green, blue. Yeah, so that's where Okay, and now every. And P is. A, X is a set of people in this room. So people means people in this room. So for every X, you're going to pick an element of A and you're going to pick an element of B. So everyone in this room has already now picked a number and a, a color. Then, everyone in this room has picked um, a dot in here. They've picked red, green, or blue. They've picked one or two. If they've made those two choices, they've picked exactly one dot in this square. And if they tell me what dot in the square they picked, I will tell them which, uh, which color and which, which number they picked. So, for any X, whether, no, I don't have to know how many people there are in this room to do this. I don't have to know what your choice of number or your choice of color is. I know if you, there is a unique way to get, for every point in this person in this room, there's a unique way to choose a dot, and I can recover your, your color and your number. So our choices would be F and S. Your choices are F and S. Yeah. Yep. There's very little really going on there. Q is your answer to the question, uh, which, which grid dot did you choose? Yep. And then from that information, I will recover um, your, your two choices by projecting. Um, so you talked about unique uh, universal properties. Yep. So you said you wanted to act less than that and define A cross B. Yep. So I can see that A cross B is not a universal property. Like yep. Yep. Are there any other solutions? Are there any other things in the set in this 
category that have a universal property? Yes, let's do another one. Okay. So now let's do co-products. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess that's the best kind of question is the one that leads you to exactly what you wanted to do next. <laughs> so for any A, B, um, uh, A plus B um, is a set satisfying, so, so, so given A and B, there's a set A plus B, and I'll call this um, I and L and I and R. And this has a universal property that if I have any other imposter thing, well, this one's going to be the closest one. So we have this. And for all x, um, i, j, or uh, l, r, there exists a unique, um, so there's a plus b, there's a, there's b, they both map into it, there's x, and a, there exists a unique Q, let's say, Q. And Q goes from A plus B to X. Such that Q followed by or preceded by in left is L and followed, preceded by in right is R. So what is this coproduct thing? I've defined it, and you probably, because I've used, this defines it completely. If there is such a thing in sets, there's only one of them. Or all of them are isomorphic. Any two ways of doing this, any two implementations of A plus B are going to be isomorphic. And I could prove that to you uh, using exactly this universal property, because I'm going to be able to put your implementation of A plus B there, and my implementation of A plus B there, and get a unique map from mine to yours. And then I'm going to reverse them and get a unique map from yours to mine. And then I'm going to have two maps. Then I'm going to have a map from me to myself, and I know it's got to be the identity. So that's a proof if you slow that down and like watch it three <laughs> times. Um, but there's a unique one of these guys up to isomorphism, kind of like smiley versus one versus star. There's a unique A plus B, and you can just implement it different ways. And I've completely defined it up to isomorphism if it exists. And it does in the category of sets. There is something satisfying this. And what it is is you take A, your bag of dots, you take B, and instead of um, taking the grid, you just union them together. And now you have A plus B. And you get a map in left that takes your A and puts it in this big, bigger bag. And you get a map in right that takes your B and puts it in this bigger bag. And what it's saying is that, suppose you had a map, so let's take this side of the room as A and this side of the B, room as B. And let's, everyone pick a color over there, everyone pick a color over here. So A, everyone in A has picked a color, everyone in B has picked a color, color is X. And so this is the left half of the room and this is the right half of the room for me. Um, so you've all picked that color. Well then, there's a unique way that, in fact, the whole co-product or union of everyone in this room has picked a color. Such that uh, the color that the union room picked, when you look at either side, was the color you originally picked. That's what these things say. So we're not leaving anything up to chance, and there's no um, assumptions or that this is the whole mathematical definition of coproduct. And it makes sense in any category whether or not that category can fulfill this obligation, this is what it would mean. If you say my category has coproducts, it means your category can take any A and B and fulfill this obligation of making an A plus B type. So is it required to have a Q bar going the other direction or no? No. No. So how can I tell that might not happen? Um, well, yeah, no. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's no requirement going the other direction. 
So for example, let's say A is the empty set and B is the empty set and X is the one element set and there's these two maps. This is a kind of degenerate example, but then the coproduct is A plus B. The coproduct of empty set and empty set is the union, which is empty set. And there's a unique map that goes from empty set to one, but there's no map going backwards. So we're back to one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, like the coproduct, the plus sign basically says you're, you're, you're doing it two sets, right? Yeah. And the other one, you're just finding the relationship between each of the elements. Which other one? The product. The product, I'm, I'm joining them in a different way. I'm joining them into a grid, and yeah. But yeah, this one feels more like joining this one. Is that other one a relation, is what he was asking? Yeah. None, all these are just functions and not relations. <coughs> Every function can be thought of as a relation, but not vice versa. Um, in fact, the, the symbols I'm using um, make sense for set. So let's say there's a whole bunch of finite sets for and for every finite set, sorry, there's a finite set, let's call it one underline, and it's the set with one element called one. There's a set called two underline, which is the set one, two. So n underline will be the set one, two, n. So 17 underline. Now if I take one underline, sorry, if I take m underline and add it to n underline, these are sets, and this is what I'm talking about here is the coproduct. So I take the one, you know, the M element set and the N element set, and I do this union thing. So I get one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to M, and I get a second copy of one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to N, and I union them all together, and I can tell which one comes from which side. What would be the set of one? So let's say, what is the set 1 plus 1, 2? This would have to be something like um, in left, well, I don't know how to write this. Let's see. Uh, A comma 1, B comma 1, B comma 2. Now, where those A and B came from is just my own implementation of this coproduct. I'm allowed to implement it any way I want, as long as I can prove it has a universal property. And I chose to think of this set as I'm labeling this set by A's and this set by B's. And I know there's a map from 1 into here. I'm just going to send 1 to A1. And there's a set from 1, 2 into here that sends it to the B side. And now for any way, any function from this thing to, a, to X and function from this thing to X, there's a unique function from this thing to X. So how many elements did this thing turn out to have? It had three. And in fact, m plus n coproduct, I know this is low, sorry about that, coproduct of sets is always isomorphic to m plus n underline, where this is addition of numbers. So I take m and m, I take 5 and 7, and I add them, and I get 12. And I underline it, which means I take 1, 2, 3, 4, all up to 12. That's the same thing as that's isomorphic to any implementation of the coproduct of 5 and 7. What I'm trying to say here is that this plus sign is n confusing in the good way, meaning <laughs> if you forget, if you kind of think of it in the old-fashioned like plus from, from, from school, you don't get confused. Uh, you don't, you'll get wrong answers as long as you keep your typing correct. So one of them's plus in numbers, one of them's plus in sets. As long as you keep your pluses, your typing correct, um, you'll know what this, sim this equation means. And it says, don't worry, like, it's the same kind of plus. And similarly, it's the same kind of times. If I take m and I take n and I multiply them as sets times in set, that's the same thing as m times n, like in school, uh, 5 and 7, I get 35 element set. And that 35 element set is, is a way of labeling the grid points in a 5 by 7 grid with the numbers 1 through 35. And that's supposed to be an isomorphism. It's an isomorphism in set. They're not exactly the same set. One's a grid, and one's the numbers 1 through 35, but they're isomorphic. There's a way to, of translating between those two things. OK, so that's what products are. 
um, and what coproducts are. And we have, oh, and then let's talk about exponentials and currying. So exponentials are going to be things like m to the n. That's the way we write it. But, um, but you should think of it, if it's at all, if you want, you, sh you could think of it as currying or, or related. Actually, you should think of it as function objects. Function objects. I think currying will come later, a little later. No, it'll come. OK, function objects. Um, so how many functions are there from that, that set to that set? Eight. Eight. I agree. So for each of these guys, they pick one of two. And uh, that's two choices times two choices times two choices. There's eight. So it's two to the three. And the fact is, um, so hom, hom a b. If you remember what that meant, it means the number of the set of functions from a to b is is a set. So it's actually an object in this category. So the function type from a to b is a first class citizen. It is a set. I'm trying to use functional language type idiom. So. Uh, so this is a set denoted, so internally, it's denoted b to the a. So the point is that 2 to the 3 underline is 2 underline to the 3 underline. So here's 3, and we're calling it a. And here's b, we're calling it, and that's 2. So I can either, so, so I again get this kind of, I'm trying to say that the notation, this kind of notation a to the b or b to the a um, is appropriate for, for thinking about numbers as finite sets. Every number can be thought of as a finite set via this translation system. And that translation system together with the notation will not steer you wrong. So, so any questions about that? So that's what an exponential object is. It's the, it's the homped. So this is where you would probably write um, a arrow b, uh, a type. It's the function type a, to the a arrow b, but in math we write it b to the a power because it's just more old fashioned or something. Um, it's a set. It's its own, fun it's its own type. And uh, yeah. And this, yes. I was saying underline. Yeah. Okay. It's like if I want to call, if I want to think of this, this is a set, whereas n is a number, and. Um, this is like the quintessential n element set in the sense that it is, is an n element set and it's isomorphic to or bijective with every other one. So yeah, that's exactly right. Can you just say that as an ending, that's the definition of the finite numbers. So in math, yeah, we, in mathematics we a cardinality or size is a bijection. So bijection is an equivalence relation. If you have any two sets, you have a bijection between them. That is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Like you can kind of compose those. Um, and the set of equivalence classes of, of finite sets are the natural numbers. That's. What's the difference between bijection and isomorphism? Nothing. A bijection means isomorphism in set in the category of sets. In other categories, you might not even want to say, what a, say the word bijection. Yeah. So I, when I say it, I'm, I'm, not, I'm forgetting which one I'm supposed to be using. I think I want to use isomorphism in here. Um, 
In sets, it turns out that if a function is surjective and injective, meaning it's one-to-one -one and onto, then it happens to be an isomorphism. And that's, that's where the term bijective comes from. So exponentials, it's called exponentials, meaning functions, function sets, function types, uh, satisfy a universal property too. But um, it is that, or it, satisfy, it does satisfy universal property. I'm going to tell you a related fact. For any ABC, a function from, from A times B to C means I have two knobs, one for A and one for B, and for any position of those two knobs, I get a C. And you know well that that is the same thing as, or there's an isomorphism called currying that turns that into um, You might not remember which one this was, but this takes a B and gives a C. So given a two-knob function from A, B to C, I get a one-knob function from A that returns a function from B to C. And that's currying, and the backwards map is uncurrying, or maybe they're the other one. So what this says in kind of exponential notation is that C to the A times B is isomorphic to C to the A, oops, C to the B, to the A, which is a fact you know from math. <laughs> What's that thing called? <laughs> um, hey, can you take it to the next level? Because everybody talks about this in the literature, but nobody really talks about like, yeah, but what happens? Because we talk about functions. We have functions that have three, four, five arguments right. all the time. So what's a three argument thing look like? So they're all, I skipped a step, but there you go. So it says, um, I can think of this three argument function as a one argument function that returns a two argument function, or uh, a different one that takes, so that's isomorphic to, so since a1 times a2 is, <coughs> happens to be isomorphic to a2 times a1, that's true in any category where this makes sense. Where, pro where products exist. Um, I can reverse anything I want. So this takes an A3 and an A1, and sorry, it takes an A2 and returns an A1, A3 function. Or it takes an A3 and returns a function that takes an A2, that returns a function that takes an A1 and returns a C. And all these are just iterated applications of this idea, putting different things in parentheses. That's, that is currying. Curry and uncurry are the two. Remember, an isomorphism means a map one way and the other way, such that when you go around the circle in either direction, you get back where you started. So if you curry a function and uncurry it, you get back where you started. What that means, right? Exactly. Yeah. Here's, here's maybe more the form that you'd want to see. Um, A, sorry, what? C to the B. Um, there is a map from C, from B times C to the B to B. So we have this. What did I do? C. Yeah, for such that. For any um, x and map from b times x to c, there exists a unique uh, x to c to the b such that b times x mapping to uh, b times c to the b, mapping to c,
This could be called ev. I take a b and a function from b to c, and I return a c. I evaluate the function. Um, ev q. There exists a unique q. So this looks more like the other universal property they wrote. 